All right, so uh, today we come to the chapter uh, in which Brother Lewis talks about God's work since creation. And uh, he kind of begins with a concept that Andrew uh, taught us last week concerning Sabbath. And uh, notice Genesis chapter 2, and we want to look at verse 3. So, of course, the Bible begins with uh, an account of God's creation. And it says that God created uh, the material universe in six days. And then we're told, Genesis chapter 2, we'll read verses 2 and 3. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he had rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Now the traditional rendering there, God rested on the seventh day. It's what you find in the King James and nearly all translations. But David uh, brought up kind of the challenge of that concept last week not necessarily talking about the word rested, but, uh, but a parallel word that's used in Exodus chapter 31. And, you know, the idea of God resting, you know, may make you think that, that boy, God had really spent his energies in creation. And, you know, he gets to that, that seventh day and he's done and sweat is dripping from his brow and he's a little bit bent over because he's tired. And so he had to rest on the seventh day. But, of course, you know, that's not the biblical picture of God. God is all-powerful in Scripture. And so um, we brought up a verse last week, Isaiah 40, verse 28, that really brings that out. Isaiah 40, 28, um, as, you know, Isaiah is, uh, quest is, is uh, teaching uh, the Jewish people who would go into exile for idolatry, and as he is railing against idols and, and arguing that Yahweh is the true God, Isaiah 40, 28 says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. So here's the idea of creation from Genesis chapter 1. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. And so here clearly in creation... God did not grow tired or weary as he created the ends of the earth. And everything that he's done since will not cause God to go tired and weary. So, uh, Brother Lewis brings up a, a really good point in the chapter. And he says the idea of, uh, in Genesis 2 uh, of God resting from the work of creation is kind of like that of a lawyer. When a lawyer will get done with his particular presentation and he says, I rest my case. There, he doesn't mean that he's tired. It means I cease my case. I'm finished with my case, and so I cease presenting my case. And one Bible translation actually uh, breaks the, tradition, the norm of traditional translation, uh, the Net Bible. Uh, and by the way, you can access the Net Bible online, and one of the neat things about the Net Bible is that it just it goes overboard with footnotes. There's over 60,000 footnotes in the Net Bible talking about why they translated particular things the way that they did. Sometimes they explain historical backgrounds. You can buy a hard copy of it, but, you know, why when you can just access it online? But it's, uh, I think, netbible.org. And uh, anyway, they translate this word as God ceased. And we know from Jesus that, you know, even though God ceased his work of creation... On the seventh day, God did not cease working. Look at John 5. John 5. <clears throat> and here Jesus is um, being criticized for having healed a man on the Sabbath day. And, uh, you know, of course, the Jews say, uh, you're not from God because you broke the Sabbath day. And somebody who truly was from God would not be breaking the fourth commandment. And so Jesus says, John 5 and verse 17, I mean, he, he, he makes the situation worse. <laughs> it 
So John 5, 17, we're told in, in his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. And so verse 18 says, for this reason they tried all the more to kill him, uh, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. <laughs> so now they're going to uh, try to kill him as a blasphemer. But, but Jesus said, even though God finished the work of creation on the seventh day, God has been working ever since. God has to preserve the creation that he made. Because, you know, keep in mind, God is the only being in all the universe with self-existence. Sometimes we, we say that God has made human beings with an eternal soul. Well, there's a sense in which that's true, and there's a sense in which that's not true. It is true in the sense that every human being will live forever in their soul, whether ultimately it's in heaven or in hell, but is not true in the sense that that human being has a self-existent soul. That, that human being's soul will live forever only because God will preserve that soul in life. You know, even in hell, God will be preserving the life of the people who are in hell. And so they're not cut off from God in that sense. They're cut off from the blessings of God, but of course they would be better off if God were to, uh, to cease allowing their soul to exist in hell. But God has been working ever since creation. So what's God been doing? Well, I took um, Brother Lewis's chapter and basically, this is the order in which he presents it, but, um, but we'll notice two main points in our outline this morning. The first point is we want to consider extra-biblical views concerning what God's been doing since creation. And then uh, the second point, we'll consider the biblical view. So what are some extra-biblical views of what God's been doing since creation? Well, Brother Lewis starts off by saying that... Uh, Jewish rabbis said that since creation, God has been pairing couples in marriage. And he tells this interesting little story of a Gentile woman who said to a rabbi, you know, what has God been doing since creation? And the rabbi said, oh, you know, he's been pairing couples in marriage. And the Gentile woman said, well, that doesn't seem too hard. Seems like God's been a little bit lazy since creation. I could do that. And so uh, this woman uh, began to prove that she could do what this rabbi said God has been doing. And so uh, she apparently owned some slaves, and she, she started pairing the slaves, the men and women, together in marriage. And the day after she had done all these pairings, she noticed that uh, some of the slaves would come in with black eyes and others with missing teeth and you know others just complaining. And uh, she realized that it actually is harder to pair you know, the right man with the right woman in marriage, and so, you know, maybe God has been active. Well, anyway, to that point, I would just say that, that it, I think you can build a biblical case that God has been active in terms of marriage since creation. You know, we look at a passage like Malachi 2, verse 14, where uh, the prophet Malachi is accusing the Jews because of their unfaithful treatment of their wives. And Malachi 2.14 says that God is a witness. He's a witness of the marriage covenant between a man and the wife of his youth. And so anytime a marriage ceremony takes place, you know, whether it's uh, in a church or at uh, the uh, uh, courthouse before the justice of the peace, God is present. You know, which, by the way, the whole idea that marriages should take place in church and that preachers should officiate in marriage, that's all traditional. You know, there is not a single thing in the New Testament that would make us think that a marriage ought to take place in church and that a preacher ought to officiate. You know, I'm glad to officiate in weddings. You know, I have, uh, I guess, power by the law to operate in that capacity, but that is all extra-biblical. But then, you know, Jesus makes the point, you know, drawing from Genesis 2.24, he makes the point that what God has joined together, talking about the husband and wife in marriage, let not man put asunder. So every time uh, a pronouncement is made, again, by a preacher or a justice of the peace, I pronounce you husband and wife, God's hand is there present, joining the two together. Now, you know, does God providentially uh, act 
to lead us to our mates? Well, you know, you find some scripture for that. Genesis 24, verse 7 says, and, and about, this is in addition to what Brother Lewis uh, said in the book. But Genesis 24, verse 7 makes the point that, you know, God led Abraham's servant to the right woman, to Rebecca, as he was sent to get a wife for Isaac. And so perhaps providentially God does the same for others. I mean, there are other passages that kind of might imply that. Look at 1 Corinthians 7, verse 17. And granted, this is a little bit of an overreading of this text, but 1 Corinthians 7, 17 says, Nevertheless, each person should live, and the whole context of this is marriage, as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them. Just as God has called them, this is the rule I lay down in all the churches. So what Paul is saying is whatever marriage you're in at the point in time that you're baptized, that's the marriage you need to stay in. And Paul makes the point that there's a sense in which that is your part assigned to you by God. And so this idea of, providence, of providence. So now whether that means that that became your part at the point in time that you said, I do, or whether that means that there may have been some providential working beforehand. I don't know from that text, but Proverbs 18.22 said, whoever finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. So anyway, so that, that's what the Jewish rabbis said. All right, on to point B. The Stoics, which was a, a philosophical sect, believed that the universe emerged out of primeval fire and from that moment endless cycles occur. And so after emerging from primeval fire the universe was destroyed by water and then it re-emerged and then later it will be destroyed by fire. And so they just argue that there's just this endless cycle from the moment of creation and it will just continue on and on and on and on. And so a lot of people have that idea that, um, well, history repeats itself. You know, it's just all this endless cycle. But, you know, that's not the biblical view. Um, the biblical view says that except for God, everything had a beginning. You know, Psalm 90 verse 2 says, from everlasting to everlasting, you're God. And so, you know, the Bible would begin by saying, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the heavens and the earth had a beginning. God alone doesn't have a beginning. And the Bible says that everything will have an end. You know, for instance, 1 Corinthians 15, 24 talks about the end when Jesus comes and all will be resurrected. And of course, other passages talk about the destruction of the universe at that point in time. So the universe had a beginning, the universe will have an end. And other passages talk about... Uh, things progressing according, uh, according to God's purpose since that time. You know, Ephesians 3.11 talks about the church being in the eternal purpose of God. So from the point of creation on through until the day of Pentecost, you had God's purpose. God was working in the world to bring about his purpose, the establishment of the church and since that time God has been working in his purpose to grow the church and get as many people as possible in the church and so as you know history that had a beginning and has an end moves forward in this linear fashion events happen that don't repeat and so here's a couple of passages you know Genesis 8 21 talks about the flood and after God destroyed the world by flood never again will that happen you know from that point on, seed time harvest, cold and heat, day and night, summer and winter, all of that will take place. There will never be a worldwide flood to destroy humanity again. Or you go to Hebrews 9, verses 25 to 28, and we're told that just as it's appointed unto man, you know, each person wants to die, and then the judgment, so Jesus Christ died, and the Greek word is strong, once for all time. You know, there, there's no need for a repetition of Jesus' death. And so, this idea of, you know, history being cyclical isn't true. Now, now you know, granted, um, there are certain patterns that tend to repeat themselves in institutions, but individual lives are just, are just very unpredictable, and that's still not the same thing as history repeating itself. Everything is moving forward 
in a linear, non-repeating fashion. All right, look at C. Other people believe that unpredictable, random chance causes everything. And you, you kind of have this idea presented in Ecclesiastes. Look at Ecclesiastes 9. Now, you know that when you read Ecclesiastes, you have to be careful. In the same way as when you read Job, you have to be careful. You know, in Job, you have to be careful because, you know, what Satan says and what Job says a lot of the time and what Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, Elihu say a lot of the time isn't true. And so the Bible is infallible in the fact that it infallibly records their errant words. <laughs> you know, its record is inerrant. But you have to be careful that you don't ascribe words uh, spoken by Job or one of the friends uh, the same weight that you ascribe to God's words. And in Ecclesiastes, you have much the same. You know, I think that Ecclesiastes is kind of, we know Solomon apostatized. And I would like to think that Ecclesiastes is a book that Solomon wrote near the end of his life. I mean, the way I think of it, uh, Song of Solomon may have been the book that Solomon wrote early in his life, you know, with this, this love of his life. And then Proverbs, he may have written kind of in the middle of his life prior to his apostasy. And then, of course, his wives lead him astray. And I would like to think that as his, his idolatrous wives led him astray, he got disillusioned with life. And in Ecclesiastes, he's trying to find the meaning to life. And he searches for the meaning of life under the sun just through observation and human reason. And finally, at the end of it, it brings him back to God. And he says, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commands, for this is the whole duty of life. And so I'd like to think that the last part of Ecclesiastes is Solomon's statement of repentance. Anyway, uh, I shouldn't have said all that, but, but all that to say, be careful when you read verses in Ecclesiastes. So look at Ecclesiastes 9, verse 11. Solomon says, I have seen. So again, a lot of Solomon's conclusions in Ecclesiastes, or thoughts, I should say, in Ecclesiastes, prior to his conclusion, are, are you know, his uninspired observation. I have seen something else under the sun. And again, that's a key phrase. The race is not to the swift, or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise, or wealth to the brilliant, or favor to the learned, but time and chance happen to them all. You know, the, the, the fastest will only run the race if he runs it at the right time, and, and if it just, things work out for him that day, is what Solomon says, and, and you know, with the rest of the illustrations. And, um, you know, I, I think there's some problems with that view, that time and chance govern everything that happens in this world. And, you know, the problem with it are certain Bible verses. Uh, you know, things may look random, but God's invisible hand causes, I won't say all things, but causes some things according to his own purposes. And we got some examples of that in Scripture. Look, look back at Ruth, Ruth chapter 2. And I mean, you know the story of Ruth. Um, so Ruth is a Moabite who ends up uh, loving uh, the mother of her deceased husband and makes up her mind that she's going to take care of her former mother-in-law. And so they leave Moabite territory, and they go back to Israel, right, as God has uh, removed the famine, and God is blessing the land. And so, you know, Ruth is going to try to provide food for her mother-in-law, Naomi. And, you know, the whole story is about how God is providentially going to get uh, a husband for Ruth, who just happens to be the kinsman redeemer, who happens to be a relative of her dead husband, and that places her in the family that will eventually result in David coming into this world and ultimately Jesus coming into this world. So this is a story that's very relevant to our redemption. This is how God saved us. But uh, Ruth chapter 2 and verse 3 says this, So she went out 
that is from from, uh, the home where she and Naomi were staying in Bethlehem, entered a field and began to glean behind the harvesters. And the uh, NIV translation is, as it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. So Boaz is her future husband. You know, as it turned out, it just looked all so random. And, uh, you know, the writer, the inspired writer, you know, is, is um, you know, saying that tongue-in-cheek, you know, the, the, the obvious implication is God is working. God got her to that field right at that time, the perfect time. It looks random, but it's not. Or look at another example of this. Look at 1 Kings 22. And, you know, 1 Kings 22, you got wicked Ahab, and, uh, you know, God is chastening Israel for its sin, its idolatry, by allowing the Syrians to conquer land, Israelite territory, that's to the east of the Jordan River. And so Ahab wants to get Ramoth Gilead back. And so he, he persuades Jehoshaphat to go to battle with him, and Jehoshaphat says, well, let's consult a prophet. And so they consult the false prophets of Baal, and Jehoshaphat, you know, isn't fooled by, you know, their uh, propaganda in behalf of the king. And, uh, or well, just acting as yes men for the king, I should say. And so, you know, he says, isn't there a prophet of Yahweh here? Well, Jezebel and Ahab, they've been killing all the prophets of Yahweh, but there is one that they've got locked up, Micaiah. And so Micaiah comes out and won't go through the whole spiel, but Micaiah says, listen, Ahab, you're not coming back from battle. You're going to die in battle. And so Ahab tries to keep Micaiah's words from coming true. And so Jehoshaphat goes in dressed up as a king into battle, which I don't know why you would ever go into battle dressed up as the king. But Ahab doesn't. Ahab disguises himself. But notice 1 Kings 22, look at verse 34. But someone, and that would be one of the Syrian soldiers, one of the Aramean soldiers, drew his bow at random and hit the king of Israel between the sections of his armor. The king told his chariot driver, wheel around and get me out of the fighting. I've been wounded. So here this Aramean soldier, I mean, he's not aiming at anybody. He just sees the fight going on and he just rears back and lets his arrow go and God's providence, even though it all looks so random, God's providence gets that arrow right to Ahab. And that that arrow doesn't hit part of Ahab's armor. It goes right in between the sections of Ahab's armor. Looks all random, but it's not. So we shouldn't have this idea that just random chance causes everything that happens. All right, uh, look at D. So the Greeks believed that there were gods, the fates, who unalterably determines each person's fate. They determine when you're going to be born. They determine when you're going to die. They determine everything that's going to happen to you in between, and there's nothing you can do about it because the fates have predetermined your life ahead of time. Now, of course, we got a version of that, a Christianized version of that, among Calvinists who believe that you know, what it means for God to be sovereign is not that he's in control of everything, but it's that he causes everything. And so God before the creation of the world, wrote the script. He foreordained everything that will come to pass. And that script is being acted out uh, in an unchangeable way from beginning to end. And so, you know, those he chose for salvation, nothing they can do about it, they're going to be saved. Those God chose for damnation, and not everybody would go so far as to be that bold to say it in that way, but that's the essence of it. Everybody that he chose for damnation, there's nothing they can do about it. They're going to be damned. And, you know, everything's just going to unfold according to the script that God wrote. But, you know, that's not biblical. Now, I definitely believe that you can say that God foreordained some things, but you can't say from the Bible that God has unchangeably foreordained all things. God has created human beings with real free will, real libertarian free will. And God allows us to use that free will without being compelled by anything outside of us to make the decisions that we make. 
And, and there are some examples in Scripture that I think that show that this is faulty. Look, look at 1 Samuel 23. 1 Samuel 23. And you know the story. David is running from Saul. And, you know, Saul is in hot pursuit. And so uh, David hears, you know, he's, he's, even though he's not king, he's been anointed to become king. And in many ways, he's acting as a king. Saul is so furious at David that he's not behaving as a king should. I mean, he's killing the priests of Yahweh and allowing the pagan nations to attack his own people and not protecting them. But here, David running from the king to save his life, and David acts like a king because David hears the first part of 1 Samuel 23 that the Philistines are attacking Keilah, this uh, town in Judah, and David goes and rescues it. And then while he's there, notice what happens. 1 Samuel 23, verse 7. <clears throat> Saul was told that David had gone to Keilah, and he said, God has delivered him into my hands, for David has imprisoned himself by entering a town with gates and bars. Now, by the way, that should warn us to be careful interpreting our circumstances. Because, you know, we often interpret our circumstances according to our own selfish thoughts at the moment. And so Saul was just so sure God was on his side. <laughs> and here's David, gone to Keilah with gates and bars, and Saul will be able, you know, David can't run from him. David will be, he can, Saul can lay siege to that city, David can't get out, and David can find, or Saul can finally kill David. But we're told, verse 8, and Saul called up all his forces for battle. Because again, you know, he, he's going to lay siege to Keilah. That's his plan. To go down to Keilah and besiege David and his men. Verse 9. When David learned that Saul was plotting against him, he said to Abiathar the priest. Now remember, Abiathar, when Saul <laughs> killed all the priests at Nob, Abiathar escaped and came to David uh, with the ephod. And you know, in the ephod, you know, you've got the breastplate of judgment, and in the breastplate of judgment, the Urim and the Thummim, through which the priest can inquire of God. So David says to Abiathar the priest, bring the ephod. David said, Lord God of Israel, your servant has learned, or has heard definitely, that Saul plans to come to Keilah and destroy the town on account of me. Will the citizens of Keilah surrender me to him? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? Lord God of Israel, tell your servant. And the Lord said he will. Saul will come down. Verse 12. Again, David asked, Will the citizens of Keilah surrender me and my men to Saul? And the Lord said, They will. Verse 13. So David and his men, about 600 in number, left Keilah and kept moving from place to place. When Saul was told that David had escaped from Keilah, he did not go there. <laughs> So God said, listen, uh, Saul will come down to Keilah. The men of Keilah will deliver you up. So David leaves. Saul doesn't come down to Keilah. The men of Keilah doesn't deliver David up. Now, if God had unchangeably foreordained all that comes to pass, then God would have unchangeably foreordained that David would leave Keilah and that Saul would not come there and the citizens of Keilah not, would not deliver him up. And so when God said that Saul would come there and that the citizens of Keilah would deliver him up, God lied. So that's, that's the dilemma you're put in. If God unchangeably foreordains all that comes to pass, as Calvinists say, then God's a liar. But the Bible says it's impossible for God to lie. Titus 1, 2, Hebrews 6, and verse 18. So that means that God allows every person to use their free will. And had David stayed in Keilah, Saul would have come there. And the citizens of Keilah would have delivered David up. So what God said to David was true at the time according to those circumstances. So, so what this shows is God does not foreordain unchangeably everything that comes to pass. God allows us to use our own free will. Okay, <clears throat> E. A lot of people ascribe to astrology. And you know there's a difference between astronomy and astrology. Astronomy is legitimate, legitimate science. The study of the heavens according to scientific principles. Astrology, uh, well, as we see, is not legitimate. You know, these people believe that, you know, the horoscope, which, you know, uh, 
reveals these secrets about the influence of the heavens. They believe that the horoscope then determines one's character and destiny. So your life is determined by what you know, sign of the horoscope you're born under. You know, what's your sign? It was a common way to, a common question that used to greet people, you know, back in the day. This actually uh, has affected some people who are Christians. First church I preached for, um, one of the members there, she really thought that, uh, you know, horoscope is important. And you pay attention to those things. And another church member was scheduled to have surgery on a particular date. And because, you know, the horoscope said that wouldn't be good for that particular person on that date, she encouraged that person to switch the surgery date, and that person did. Well, I don't think that the Bible would allow us to give such credence to the horoscope. Uh, look at Isaiah 40:26. <clears throat> so God created and controls the heavenly bodies, the stars. Isaiah 40, 40 verse 26 says, Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings about the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name, because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Now, of course, you know, you go through the Bible, you look at passages like Deuteronomy 4 and, and other passages, and you see the ancients oftentimes would bow down and worship these starry hosts. I mean, even the Jews, you know, uh, you get in Jeremiah and, and, you know, worship the queen of heaven, worship these heavenly bodies. But God created them, God controls them, they don't have any power in and of themselves. Look at what Jeremiah 10 verse 2 says. Jeremiah 10 verse 2. Well, we'll read 1 and 2. Hear what the Lord says to you, people of Israel. This is what the Lord says. Now, of course, if you got hear what the Lord says, followed by listen to what the Lord says, that repetition, that lets you know what's about to be said is pretty important. You know, we're not, God doesn't waste words. You know, think about how short the Bible really is. So every word that's in it is important. And if he says, listen to me, listen to me, you know, this is important. Do not learn the ways of the nation. Now, that's, that's a pretty relevant message for all of us now, isn't it? You know? Or be terrified by the signs of the heavens, though the nations are terrified by them, for the practices of the people are worthless. And then goes on and on. And by the way, what he describes next is not forbidding a Christmas tree. <laughs> He's talking about making an idol. But that's often used, or been often used to, to forbid making a Christmas tree. But, point is, you know, we should not seek... Uh, ethical, spiritual, decisional guidance from the heavenly bodies. You know, not, not true. They're there, Genesis 1, for signs, for seasons, for days and years. You know, of course, by looking at the heavens, we understand changing of the seasons, days, all that sort of stuff. But that's, that's not what we're saying. Don't seek from the heavens ethical, spiritual, or decisional guidance in the way that the pagans were. I noticed uh, when I was in Britain, there was a very committed sister in the church who also was big into horoscope. Right. And I was shocked by it. But I, I guess if we had an honest poll in this room, we'd find there's some folks who read horoscopes. Don't raise your hands. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, you know, that shows lack of faith in, in the God that we serve. Right. When we start doing stuff like that. Absolutely. I mean, it is, again, in the words of Jeremiah, it's, it's learning the ways of the nations. You know, it's not something we learn from the Bible, but it's something that we learn from culture. Very good point. Any other comments about what we've said so far? Yes, sir. If an asteroid crashes into the earth, is that a sign of God's judgment? <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, this, is, this brings us back to, you remember after Hurricane Katrina? You remember how um, Jerry Falwell, and I think maybe Pat Robertson too, got into some hot water. and Well, and they said one of them maybe after 9-11 and the other after Hurricane Katrina. 
And uh, they said that, you know, to the, uh, the immoral people of the culture, I'll just leave it at that, this is because of you. But, you know, there are problems with that viewpoint. Now, uh, you know, first of all, we have to see from Scripture that, number one, that might be a result of God's judgment. Because we don't have time to get to it, but I don't think we'll have time to get to it. But on the second point, under uh, C, we'll see that God works among the nations. And God, you know, Psalm 94, chastens the nations. And God oftentimes brings disaster to the nations to bring nations to repentance. But Jesus taught us that apart from a word from God, we have no idea whether this disaster or that disaster is the result of God's chastening hand. You remember in Luke chapter 13, verses 1 to 5, some people told Jesus of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. So here are the Galileans up north in Israel. They're under the rule of Herod Antipas. They make their trip south to the temple in Jerusalem, which was you know, uh, the Roman providence ruled by a Roman governor, Pilate. And there was enmity between Pilate and Herod Antipas until you know, the time of Jesus' crucifixion. So maybe, maybe some of that was at play. And anyway, Pilate had killed these Galileans who came to Jerusalem to sacrifice. And Jesus asked the question, well, were they worse sinners than all the Galileans because they suffered this? And he said, I tell you, no. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And then Jesus brought up a situation that took place in the city of Jerusalem, or those 18 upon whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them. Now, we don't know where the Tower of Siloam was, but, but the, it was in Jerusalem. He said, were they worse sinners than all the inhabitants of Jerusalem because they suffered such things? He said, I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. So, so we have to see, number one, maybe it is, and we ought to interpret all disaster as a call to repentance. But we have to say, number two, there's no way to be sure. You know. Other comments? Mike, I have one. You remember when you were, me and Yolanda were talking when we were out <clears throat> yesterday and we were bringing up the point that you, you made a point that not everyone, that the Christians and non-Christians kind of die at the same rate. So we can't, we, we, so we won't be disappointed if, if death hits us or unfortunate circumstances hit us. And I think you were making it kind of in a general sense. But counter to that, isn't there something saying, isn't there something script, scriptural that talks about the wisdom of living a sacrificial life as opposed to one that feeds your flesh, that, that, that where, where calamity is more likely to happen to you because of your disobedience? Uh, look, at, look at a passage like, Proverbs, well, let's see. Let me think of one I can find fast. Let's see. Uh, look at Proverbs 3. No, no, let's, let's do this. I can, I can illustrate this one better. Look at Proverbs 16. No, no, <laughs> Proverbs 3. Because right to your point about, about life, that's, that's, that's what we want to do, long life. So look at Proverbs 3. Look at verses 1 and 2. No, no, go to Pro no, I'm just joking. <laughs> that, was, that was a joke. All right, look, look at 3 verses 1 and 2. My son... Solomon says, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Okay, question. Did anyone exemplify the wisdom of Proverbs better than Jesus? He, 1 Corinthians 1.30, he is for us wisdom. And would anybody here say that, I mean, we don't know that this was the exact age, but, you know, Roughly 33, is that a long life? No, I mean, you know, even in that day, that was, that was a premature death. And so the point is, generally speaking, following the guidance of Scripture, the wise guidance of Scripture, generally speaking, that will prolong your life. 
But that's not always the case. You have to be careful with some of these things because they're general statements. You know, like, like even, you know, David said, I've been young, now I'm old, I've not seen the righteous forsaken nor a seed begging bread. Psalm 37, 25. Well, he didn't see Lazarus <laughs> in, in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 and following because here's a righteous man who begged at the rich man's doorstep and starved to death. So these are general, general principles. And, and with my point, it was the objective isn't even to live a long time because I don't know if you want quality over quantity. Uh, mine is more like the, the least amount of self-inflicted harm because you're not obedient. Well, and, and I should say, there's another side to it. Yeah. We have to read the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament. And, of course, there's a sense in which following the guidance of Scripture, even if you die at 33, will result, if you're faithful, will result in a long life because it will result in eternal life. So there's that extra layer of the New Testament. You know, that's not strictly speaking in the text itself, right? But that, that comes from what we're taught to do, read the Old Testament through the lens of the New. Andrew? Right. Uh, that stood out in some of our reading last night in Ezekiel. You know, I think we need to take into account how severe that might be uh, in, in practicing that. In Ezekiel 8, God is showing Ezekiel the abominations that are occurring right. in Jerusalem at that point. And in the beginning of verse 16 to the end of the chapter, he talks about 25 men who are between the torch and the altar. And something I read that would probably only be priests. And they are bowing down and worshiping the sun towards the east. And, you know, that, that you could say that that's worshiping an idolatrous God, but Deuteronomy would forbid worshiping any of the hosts of heaven, whether it's right. sun or moon or stars. <clears throat> and God is listing this as an abomination, and this will later be linked to, the, to God's spirit leaving Jerusalem. Right. And so it, involving ourselves in any of these practices that are of the world that are astrological or whatever, I think we need to really take into account the seriousness that that might have with us before God. <clears throat> That's, that is a great point. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, on that, First uh, Chronicles 24 says that there are 24 courses, 24 uh, groups of priests. And so if you, if you take those 24 courses, one from each 24, and you add to them the high priest, then that would be the 25. So, you're, I mean, you're right. And the, but, but, yeah, I mean, uh, it's such an abomination before God because it's trusting in something other than God. You know, God, you know, uh, you know, try it sometime. You go home and tell your wife, you know, hey, you know, I, th I think you ought to let me have another wife, too. <laughs> so will you let her come in? I mean, she'll just be a concubine. Would you, let, would you let her come in and just sleep in the spare bedroom and I'll just kind of split my time? You know, how's that going to go? Well, you might get your concubine, but you're going to lose your wife. She won't tolerate rivals, and God won't tolerate rivals. He's a jealous God. He wants all of our trust in him, and not, not in astrology, not in other practices of the occult, not in anything else. Good observation. All right. I'm, not, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I just want to say, don't you think a lot of times that we also use a lot of those kind of things kind of as a being a little lazy and also kind of self-serving like you were saying before because – a lot of it is inaccurate too, or it doesn't work out, or it's kind of coincidental thing, but we only pay attention if it works out. You know what I'm saying? Like we're not really keeping tally. It's just kind of like when you don't want to think, and you just kind of want to, you know, well, you're a Virgo, da 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 da, and that type of thing. I don't know if that Well, I think, what I, to me, I think most of it, it's, it's what you find, what is it, Isaiah, is it Isaiah 513 and Hosea 412, both passages? say basically my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge mm -hmm. and I think I think it's it's um you know Proverbs describes the simple person the simple person is destroyed the simple person is not someone who's intentionally rebellious it's just the person who's not educated right. they're just it's it's you know kind of a foolish person and they're you know maybe somewhat innocent in their foolishness but you know not really because it's it's our obligation to figure out what God's will for our life is and then do it. And I think I think that's probably what it comes down to.